Now we're going to turn to the next item of business, which is topical questions. Our first question today is from Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what the daily average of COVID-19 tests carried out last week was. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. During the week commencing Monday 25th of May, there were an average of 4,624 tests carried out on the Scottish population each day. This does not include the numbers for home testing. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? This figure falls well short of the promise made by Nicola Sturgeon that we would have 10,000 tests a day by the end of April, which was subsequently revised to 15,000 tests a day by the 26th of May. Indeed, yesterday was the lowest number of tests carried out, only 2,729 um, and only 937 new people tested. These figures are the lowest four months, and only 2.1% of the population has actually had a test. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain why testing is not even a third of the capacity available in Scotland, and considerably less than 10% of the number of tests routinely carried out by the NHS in England? And can she also explain why we have one of the worst testing rates in Europe, if not the world? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank Ms Bailey for that Supplementary, let me correct a couple of things though before I respond to it. First of all, the First Minister did not say that there would be 10,000 tests a day. What we said and delivered on was an initial increase in capacity to uh, 8,000 and then a further increase in capacity uh, last week to the end of May of 15,500. That is capacity. Uh, that uh, is not the number of tests per day and in both of those the, the capacity commitments were delivered on. In terms of how the testing capacity is used, it is used in two ways. The first of those is largely demand-led, so it is led by uh, those key workers now across a range of sectors, and inclu including now everyone over the age of five who have uh, symptoms uh, to uh, go for a test. And that is primarily done through the uh, UK government regional testing centres and processed in the Lighthouse Lab. The NHS labs are delivering on tests taken for those over 70 who are admitted in a hospital setting. At the moment, that is clearly a reduced number given the pause that we have put on so much of the NHS work. Those in ICU, as uh, Ms Bailey will know, we're uh, fortunate that th that number is reducing. Those in hospital, clearly, uh, for COVID, and also in our care homes, and that care home testing is uh, being rolled out. Many uh, of our board areas have now completed their care home testing of those homes with cases and are working through those uh, care workers in homes uh, where there is no active case at this point. The capacity that we have created and we need to go further is in order to ensure that we have the capacity in our NHS system in order to cope with what may be the demands that come as a consequence of easing lockdown measures and seeing an increase in the transmission of the virus, which we will then uh, uh, deal with through the test and protect system. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that further response, although I am surprised at her defence because I'm sure she would agree with me that there is absolutely no point in having capacity unless you're actually going to use it. Um, let me say the Cabinet Secretary has made a number of announcements about extending testing, which she's outlined, twice in March, three times in April, twice in May. That suggests that the eligibility criteria were far too narrow to start with and remains too narrow now. The World Health Organization told us months ago that asymptomatic people were carriers too, and the more that were tested, the better. Given that we're now moving to the test and trace phase, where testing will be critical to managing a return to work, will the Scottish Government finally follow the advice of experts at the World Health Organization, whose mantra is test, 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 or are our clinicians more expert than those world experts? Cabinet Secretary. So, so a number of points. First of all, what I said in response to both those questions wasn't a defence, it was an explanation. And secondly, eligibility was increased as the evidence that appeared suggested that it was possible to increase. But more importantly, let me just quote from the World Health Organisation with respect to uh, asymptomatic 
individuals. Uh, we have consistently taken a precautionary approach in relation to asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission. On April 2nd, the World Health Organization statement said there has been no documented asymptomatic transmission. As the First Minister has said, as I have said, uh, in the early days of this pandemic, uh, the uh, clear advice that we were receiving from scientific experts and from our clinic clinical experts was that there was no transmission from asymptomatic individuals. That has changed over time. I have to say there is still no set view on the part of the same scientific or clinical community on this and also on the difference between being infected and being infectious in those individuals who are asymptomatic. Nonetheless, taking that precautionary approach, that is why we have introduced uh, testing to care workers in care homes uh, where there is no active case and those care workers uh, have no symptoms. And we will continue to consider, as we look to remobilise our health service, in what way further testing can assist us to do that safely. Thank you. Brian Whittle to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, given the need and the important need to get the R numbers down, wouldn't it make sense to focus all that spare capacity where the biggest impact from COVID is being felt and where the highest R number now resides in our care homes? Secretary. But, but that is precisely what we are doing. We are testing uh, in our care homes, in those care homes with an active case, all residents and all care workers. And we are testing in those care homes, care workers, where there is no active case. So that is precisely our focus, uh, as well as the work that is underway in the hospital setting. And as I've said, further consideration as we remobilise the health service, the debate we will come on to, as to whether or not testing can assist us to do that in terms of the safety of both patients and staff. But I need to remind members that what the test tells you is on the day in which the swab was taken, were you symptomatic of COVID-19 or not? It does not tell you whether you were symptomatic two days later. It tells you on the day. So if you're asymptomatic and you test negative, then that test has to be repeated. And that is precisely what we will do in these, those care homes which have no active case in testing care workers. It will be an iterative process, repeating sev every seven days. Lee MacArthur, to be followed by David Torrance. Thanks, Presiding Officer. As I highlighted with the First Minister last month, giving people access to information about the level of testing that is taking place at a local level going to be key to building public confidence and securing compliance as we move ahead with test and protect. First Minister appeared to agree, yet there's still no sign of this data being made available to people in Orkney or across Scotland. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary um, when the public can expect to be able to access this and other relevant information relating to test and protect? Cabinet Secretary. So we will be able to provide information shortly on uh, the tests that are uh, conducted through our NHS uh, controlled facilities. That's not just our NHS labs, that's now our partners in uh, three of the major universities in, and in the Scottish Blood Transfusion Service. Uh, over the coming days, once we are sure that the evidence or the, the, the numbers that they are uh, giving us through Public Health Scotland are robust and make sense, should bear in mind that sometimes a test may be taken in a particular board area, but actually processed through a lab in another board area in order to ensure that we meet the timelines that we need to meet of uh, as close to 24 hours as can possibly be uh, managed. What we won't be able to do, though, is break down the number of tests that go through the Lighthouse Lab uh, because we get that figure for Scotland as a whole, not necessarily for different parts of the country. But we're working to make sure we can give as clear uh, and robust data as we possibly can. And as soon as we're ready to publish that and with what frequency we will update it, I'll make sure certainly that Mr MacArthur knows that. David Torrance, be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the importance of flexibility when it comes to scaling up contact tracing, depending on demand. Can she outline how the Scottish Government will be assessing the demand? Cabinet Secretary. 
So the, the demand come, the, the assessment of the testing capacity that is needed comes by pulling together uh, all the information we have. So we know the numbers that we uh, need to test uh, in terms of existing 70-year-olds, for example, being admitted to hospital. We will be able to project that number as we look to restart, for example, elective uh, care in our uh, NHS. We know the numbers that will come through uh, in terms of health and social care key workers, although that is a declining number. And we know what our care home demand will be in us, both as we uh, go through the testing of those with active cases, but also increasingly continue to test uh, care workers in those homes that don't have active cases. We also then get the demand from the, the modelling estimate, which produces for us the R number, but also uh, the number of uh, individuals across Scotland who it is anticipated uh, have the virus. And of course, uh, through the work on test and trace, uh, test and protect, where the, the message that we're sending to the public is a different message from before. The message now is, if you have symptoms, please uh, get in touch with NHS Inform or NHS 24 and book a test. All of that's factored into the modelling, which takes us forward in terms of how much more than a capacity of 15,500 do we need to have for testing in Scotland. Alison Johnson. Thank you. On the 18th of May, the Scottish Government widened access to testing so that anyone with symptoms could get a test and introduced routine testing for 53,000 members of staff in care homes. At this point, before these changes, 5,000 tests were being carried out each day. And as we've just heard, since then, the number of tests has actually decreased. To test staff in care homes weekly, some 7,000 plus tests would have to be carried out each day. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that this is the Scottish Government's intention? And if so, when will this start? Cabinet Secretary. So it, it has started. The, the first thing I need to say is that the drive-through test numbers, either, in other words, those regional test centres, the numbers there, which is largely uh, that wide eligibility group of anyone now over the age of five who has symptoms, has declined uh, over the recent period. And to a degree, that is not a surprise in as much as uh, the R number uh, is reducing, the, the level of the virus at the moment in Scotland uh, is low. And so you would reasonably expect a lower number of individuals to have symptoms and to uh, seek a test. In terms of care homes, that work has begun and uh, all the boards uh, have now produced uh, plans which identify the priority in which they are going round the numbers of care homes that they have, undertaking the testing, including those where there is no case and it is uh, care workers that they are testing. There are a number of uh, uh, glitches, I would say, in, in the path there. One of them is has been up until uh, a week ago, those care workers who were uh, reluctant to be tested because their terms and conditions from their employer was such that their weekly income would reduce uh, significantly if they tested positive. We have now acted as a government uh, to resolve that impossible dilemma for, for them. Of course, individuals have to consent to be tested, so we cannot expect 100% of the number to give their consent to be tested. And in some instances, particularly care home residents, uh, where uh, consent is not possible because of the conditions that they suffer from, the clinical decision uh, would, would be made that uh, this particular test would cause too much distress uh, to force it on someone. And of course, you can't force a test on any individual. Um, but in those circumstances, of course, testing is not the only route by which, by any means, by which care homes should be preventing the transmission of the virus between one resident and another. They should be the, following the guidance clearly issued and uh, reissued from the 13th of March onwards. Thank you. Question number two, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that there's been around 600 more deaths in care homes from COVID-19 than officially recorded. Every week, the uh, uh, National Records of Scotland, NRS, publish the number of registered deaths where COVID-19 has been recorded. 
by a medical professional on a death certificate. NRS figures show that there are 2,350 excess deaths in care homes during the pandemic uh, up to uh, their publication last week. Of this, 74% had COVID-19 recorded on the death certificate, either as a suspected or a probable factor in the death. Of the remaining 601, the doctor who certified the death did not record COVID-19 on the certificate, either as a cause or suspected cause of death. Scottish Government, with Public Health Scotland and NRS, are working to explore excess deaths as part of a wider piece of work to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the population. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. For several weeks, the First Minister has repeatedly suggested that the UK Government was undercounting the number of care home deaths, but this now appears to be the case in Scotland. So can the Cabinet Secretary say how many deaths there have been in care homes where people have been removed from a care home to a hospital setting? Does she know that figure? Does the Cabinet Secretary also now accept that, at least in some of these cases, excess deaths in care homes that have not been recorded as COVID-19 related could actually be COVID-19? Well, in response to the latter part of that question, neither I nor Mr Briggs are clinically qualified, and so I wouldn't gainsay the professional reputation, competence or expertise of those medical practitioners who take exceptionally seriously the signing of death certificates, nor would I have the audacity to question whether or not they had recorded these matters properly. Secondly, the First Minister did not suggest uh, or state anything to do with how other countries in the UK record their figures. She simply spoke in detail about how we record our figures. And uh, the member will know those, uh, that very clearly. In terms of uh, where uh, deaths are recorded as happening, of course, there's no gap here. NRS figures, I'm sure uh, Mr Briggs is as familiar with those weekly publications as I am, uh, give the location of the death. And so if the individual was, who died was not at home, but was in hospital, it would be recorded as a death in hospital. Uh, it was not a missing death, it's recorded as a death in hospital. If the individual was in hospital, but not in the care home, then the death would be recorded in hospital and not in the care home. So there's no suggestion here, I hope, that there is any dubiety in the figures that NRS uh, record and uh, publish and do so to the professional standards that they are required to meet. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. Last week I asked the First Minister how many patients in hospital without a pair of attorney have been placed into care homes. First Minister has still not responded to me, so can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she can provide that information today? And also, has she investigated any of these individuals who may have had a do not resuscitate order placed on them? And what legal framework are Scottish Ministers using in both these cases? Cabinet Secretary. So, first of all, I have to say that in terms of those individuals who uh, are uh, currently in hospital when they are clinically uh, able to be discharged, but they are there because uh, of adult with incapacity uh, legislation, that is legislation. It is not something Scottish ministers decide. It will be a decision on, uh, taken primarily by the mental health, designated mental health officer of the local authority, and there are various processes that individuals have to go through. In terms of the actual number, Numbers without uh, advance notice of that supplementary question. No, I do not have those, and I'm sure the First Minister will respond to Mr Briggs as she committed to. In terms of DNR, uh, I'm sure Mr Briggs will be aware of the actions that both the former CMO, the current CMO, the Royal College of General Practitioners all took to ensure that our uh, general practitioners across the country uh, and uh, our clinicians in hospital uh, understood the proper process to go through in terms of agreeing with the patient whether a DNR notice should be placed or not. There have been instances uh, where that has uh, appears to have uh, been taken inappropriately and in all of those instances we have contacted the board or the uh, relevant practice or a CMO has uh, the relevant practice concerned uh, and ensured that individuals in uh, those circumstances understand the way in which both DNR but also advanced uh, care planning needs to be undertaken. George Adam to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, provide some detail on how excess deaths in recent weeks compares in Scotland with that of other parts of the UK? 
Cabinet Secretary. So uh, there are uh, two figures, I think, uh, that may help. So in uh, the period between uh, week 11 and week 21 of the pandemic, uh, excess deaths in uh, Scotland were 39% higher than the equivalent period uh, that is being compared against, 50% higher in England and Wales. Uh, in week 21, that is the, the week for which the figures are most recently available, excess deaths in care homes in England and Wales, 63% above the five-year average, uh, Scotland 42% above the five-year average. Uh, so those are the figures. I need to also say, though, presiding officer, we're not engaged in some kind of competition here. Uh, any one of these deaths is a death to be regretted and, of course, leaves the family and their loved ones uh, devastated and grieving. And uh, every single day, uh, we at the briefing and here in this chamber, uh, if we're not at the briefing, make that very clear how seriously we take those numbers. Uh, but it is important, uh, as we have said already, to have all of these matters in a clear perspective and be accurate. Neil Findlay, to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. <coughs> President Officer, I previously asked a written parliamentary question to ask the Scottish Government how many people had been discharged from hospital to care homes since February the 1st and how many have subsequently died. The, Mr Briggs asked a similar question and I noticed the Cabinet Secretary didn't answer. So um, I wonder if I could ask again, is the Government going to pursue that and collate that information and publish it? Because the answer I got is that this information is not held centrally. It's a very, very important point. Health, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and, and Mr Finlay is correct in that the answer was correct. That information is not held centrally, uh, but we are working with uh, the various teams concerned uh, to see how much of that information we can gather. I, I cannot commit that we would be able to gather it in 100%, but as that work is, is uh, progressed, then I do undertake to make sure that Mr Finlay is updated with how far we are getting and uh, how robust we think that information is. Uh, and at the point, as with all this information, uh, when we believe it to be robust, then we will publish it. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A constituent contacted me last week whose daughter works in a care home in the north of Scotland. She recently processed the arrival of a resident who'd been transferred from the home farm care home on Skye to that home. That resident then subsequently died of COVID-19 within a week. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how widespread is the transfer of residents out of COVID outbreak homes and what infection control measures are put in place to do that safely? Cabinet Secretary. So I don't have the, the answer to the first part of Mr Cole Hamilton's question. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it is possible for me to acquire those numbers, but I am certainly prepared to undertake to consider that and look and see if we can and uh, let Mr Cole Hamilton know that. The second part of his question, though, is really important, and that is infection prevention and control measures. All care homes at all times, pre-pandemic and since, should have adequate infection prevention and control measures in place. We all know that every winter uh, our care homes suffer from norovirus to varying uh, degrees, that flu is part of uh, seasonal activity in winter and the older residents are particularly vulnerable to both of those. So all care homes should have very, very clear and uh, updated infection prevention and control measures. But in addition, in terms of the current pandemic and the current situation, of course, the guidance that was issued on the 13th of March uh, was very clear and every piece of guidance subsequently has been very clear. The current work that is underway uh, about isolating uh, individuals in uh, their own rooms uh, if they have uh, symptoms or they have come from a COVID-19 setting uh, in order to ensure that even if they had tested negative, we do, we do that for the 14 days to be sure that no symptoms do emerge. Uh, growing knowledge about the range of symptoms, particularly in older people, uh, that are there that appear to differ from those of a different age group, uh, as well as uh, all that guidance about the ending of communal activity, communal dining and so on. And now, uh, in recent weeks, the direct involvement of our directors of public health and our NHS uh, clinical teams in ensuring that all those care homes are practising 
the requirements that have been uh, theirs to meet for some considerable time. And as the member will know, the care inspectorate is undertaking a number of inspections of care homes across the country, on-site visit inspections. Thank you very much. Question number three, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to update its advice for people who are shielding. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we, we do plan to uh, update that advice. That, that should not be taken at this point as any indication that that advice uh, will necessarily change. Uh, but we do know and recognise that those who are currently shielding, who are the group of people of whom the most has been asked in this recent period, that they want to know what will happen next and what that means for them. We, we need to ensure as best we can that the approach we take is the right approach. Uh, so led by our chief medical officer and his uh, advisory group of clinicians, they are working through uh, whether or not they believe there is any possibility of easing the current restrictions on that group. Uh, or not at this, at this point as we come to the end of the first period in which we asked people to shield. Uh, they're working through that in order to provide clinical advice. Uh, what we will make sure that we do though, they're working to a timetable that ensures this, is that individuals in that group will be given that, that clear advice in advance of the end of the current shielding period. Advice about the level of risk that those clinicians believe individuals face, about what we are asking them to do to uh, shield themselves against that risk, what they individually can do, and importantly, advice for those who are supporting them about what they need to do in order to ensure that they mitigate risk, and of course, what support we will continue to offer uh, individuals in that group uh, and to ensure that they have access to uh, to medicine, to food, uh, and to other support that they might need. Emma Harper. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Given that advice in England has diverged from the rest of the UK, and people in the shielding category are now being advised that they can meet other people, despite the medical and scientific evidence suggesting that it's too early for this course of action, can the Cabinet Secretary provide assurances to those shielding that this step will only be taken in Scotland when the advice and evidence suggest that it is safe to do so? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I can. That's why we have not uh, made any pronouncements so far. And I, and I understand that that, is, that can be difficult for people in Scotland who are in that group who see apparent changes uh, in England and in Wales uh, and uh, nothing so far here, which is why we have uh, made such uh, an effort to continuously say, you know, we, are, we have not forgotten you, you do matter, and we are working on this because uh, you are so important. We are also making sure that we hear from those who are currently shielding. So since the 29th of April, we've been undertaking research interviews with uh, people who are shielding, and until the 14th of June, uh, people who are shielding can also respond to a Public Health Scotland survey, which they can find at surveys.publichealthscotland.scot, so that we can hear from them about what matters most to them and try as best we can to weave that into the advice and the guidance that we give. And Emma Harper. Thank you again, Cabinet Secretary. We saw reports over the weekend of vulnerable people in England being told they have been removed from shielding lists via text message without even the knowledge of their own GPs. And the Cabinet Secretary talks about advice uh, given to our uh, shielding people. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government will communicate any changes to guidance with those who are currently shielding? And will there be flexibility for people to adapt their behaviour in consultation with their own clinicians? Cabinet Secretary. So the, the shielding list, as I'm sure Ms Harper and others recall, was drawn up in the first place by the four CMOs, an agreement between the four CMOs uh, of uh, the nations of the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, my understanding is that the removal of some of the clinical groups uh, from that list uh, for England uh, was uh, not, part, not agreed between the four CMOs. Uh, we, uh, 
are not currently uh, intending at this point to do that, although uh, the clinical group that I mentioned is looking very carefully, uh, not at removing people from the shielding group, but uh, whether or not advice depending on the condition uh, should vary or whether that is too early for that to happen. The, num the, pe the clinical groups on the shielding list, as you will know, uh, have altered uh, over time and of course it, is, it remains possible for an individual GP or consultant clinician to add someone to the list if they feel uh, that they should be on it. Splenectomy, for example, was a group recently added uh, to that list. Uh, but in terms of how we will communicate with people, once we have that clinical advice, uh, then we will be communicating with people as we did in the outset. And that is a very detailed, clear letter, uh, a route to go if you have further questions, who you should speak to about your personal situation, where you go in order to get uh, that local, locally delivered support. There may be some people who didn't register for support first time round, but we'll need it now. Uh, so again, repeating all of that, but giving people all of that uh, information and advice and guidance in advance of any change that we are going to introduce so that they have time to ask questions, to understand what any change involves uh, and to uh, arrange how they are living uh, to accommodate that if that is what they wish to do. And Willie Rennie. Um, there are those who are in the over 70s group who are unclear about what the guidance is for them. Some have been following the shielding guidance, even though they're not on the shielding list. When the new shielding guidance is out, will there be a revision for the over 70s as well? Cabinet Secretary. So I, th I think what is fair to say, precisely because of the point that uh, Mr Rennie has made, is that there will be clarification for uh, that group of people who are not in the shielding list but are over 70 years old uh, or are in the group of people who currently are eligible for the flu jab about how they uh, have the same uh, restrictions as everyone else imposed on them uh, but need to take additional uh, care in terms of being outside, in terms of the two metre distance, the wearing of face coverings and so on. So we will look to uh, ensure that people no longer uh, feel that the shielding advice applies to them, but are clear about what advice does apply to them and have that clarity with additional advice that says, um, these, these are the reasons why we believe you need to take additional care to the 20-year-old grandson that you have or the 40-year-old daughter. This is why you need to take a bit of additional care and here's what that additional care should be. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions.